Meeting of Council, Monday, September 24th, 7 p.m. to order. Uh, we acknowledge we are meeting on the shared traditional lands of our Coast Salish peoples. And just before we move to approve the agenda, I understand there is one item that is to be pulled from tonight's agenda in that there is a report that uh, was not attached and we will be dealing with it on the October uh, 9th meeting. So that would be under new business 6.1.3, which were proposed amendments to Colwood Land Use Bylaw number 151. With that, that amended agenda, I'm looking for approval. Move approval. Second. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. Uh, first item is for the public participation and allow for the public to make comment or come to the podium. Name, address, and uh, proceed. Hi, my name is Wendy Sue Andrew. My address is 1707 Mortimer Street, Victoria, BC. I'm here representing Namaste Transition to Community so Society. I'm a parent of a young adult who attends Namaste, and we are looking to advocate for Kiosa in terms of a, a tax variance. And you will be staying through that should there be any inquiries? Staying here, yeah, absolutely. And we're, we're really happy to answer any um, inquiries about that application. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Philip Nurse. I'm the general manager of Royal Colwood Golf Club, representing Royal Colwood. Um, it's regarding the urban tree forest bylaw that's being proposed tonight, coming forward. Um, it's regarding um, after section one, section five, number one I, which is the exemption if you have a forest vegetation plan. My question to council and to the staff is that, does that mean anybody who has a forest vegetation plan that's been approved is exempt from everything below? Um, it is vague and it is never referenced again anywhere above. As an example, the one to five ratio of a, or removal in a year, if you extend that, there's no reference to any kind of plan at all including as well their planting ratio, the one to one, one to two. If you have a forest vegetation plan, does that mean you're exempt from any of those ratios or do you have to follow that as well? And it, it is vague, it doesn't mention that at all. So I'll leave that right now, thank you. Thank you. Judith Bellington, 3338 ASMIC, um, also here to talk about the um, urban forest bylaw. Um, very happy to see this coming forward. Um, just four very quick things that I wanted to, to touch on. Um, one is, I know Sandra will do her usual exemplary job of kind of getting a good um, communications piece out there following this because it's quite complicated when you read through the bylaw. One of the things that I would ask is that it is clear that this bylaw applies where you are not in the environmental development permit area and where you are in an environmental development permit area, those rules apply. That was always something that the committee wrestled with. It, it was a bit complicated and I, I think we need to make sure that people understand where that, where that sits. Um, I had one very minor question um, and you may want to check with staff for clarification when you're talking about it. Um, 5C talks about the tree cutting or uh, the permit is not required where the tree cutting or removal is for the installation of roads or services, um, et cetera, shown on an engineering drawing, et cetera, et cetera. I was not clear whether building is also included in that. Um, and I was not clear whether that meant there was no permit required, no replacement. Um, so just a clarification around that. Um, I just wanted to say on behalf of the, the various members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to be part of that. Um, I know, I don't think there are any other members of the committee here tonight, um, but they did put in an awful lot of time and I did want to suggest to the city they might want to send them a nice little thank you note. Um, and the other thing I just wanted to perhaps say to whoever's on the next council is one of the things that was also talked about was the need not just for this bylaw but also for an urban forest management plan and that's something I would love to see brought forward um, in the next council. So, thank you. Hi, 
Don Duncan, 3341 Broberg Lock Road. It's uh, interesting, my neighbor spoke about bylaws. My question is bylaws. You guys sit here, you bring in the bylaws. My question is who the hell enforces them? Nobody does. You got some very good bylaw officers and I believe they're good people, but nothing is enforced. You bring in the bylaws, and I look at this uh, thing here. I don't want a police state, but geez, if you want this to be Langford, it's going to be Langford. It's not. It's Colwood. We got bylaws. You guys bring them in. You vote for them, but nobody enforces them. I'm not going to tell you where I live. I just did, but people... People have, are abusing it, and, and nobody comes around and looks. I have not seen a volleyball officer come down my street. I have not seen a police officer come down my street. We're paying for this, and nobody is enforcing it, and you guys are the outgoing council, and a lot of you want to get elected again. Somebody's got to stand up and say, Okay, we've got these bylaws. Again, I'm repeating myself. Sorry. I got OCDB. Um, I don't want it a police state. But you guys work for it. Enforce it. Thank you. Any further questions or, or not questions, but any further uh, comments? Good evening. My name is Bill Sainsbury. I live at 3366 Ocean Boulevard. Here tonight in support of uh, our development variance permit application for our house. Essentially a very simple project. We have a garage that we would like to raise the floor level to get a second level on it so we can put a single suite in there for our son as well as gain some storage area. We will be using existing foundations and going to flat roof rather than any pitched roof so that we minimize any effect on the neighbors. Uh, and final comment to it out of our letter uh, supporting the application initially. This application contains the elements expressed in OCP policy 9213, which has the objective of supporting the expansion of secondary suites, including coach houses throughout the city. With this in mind, we hope the board will look with favor on our proposal and grant the exemptions requested. Thank you. And here to answer questions. Thank you. Any other members of the public? Thank you. Bill Pemberton. I live up the road there. Um, I came across your pre by law, and I have a rather awkward situation in that trees that we planted at our house eventually have killed off the lawn for obvious reasons. And the lawn is over the septic tank, the field, sorry. So if I'm not allowed to cut the trees down, I can't keep the grass over the top of the septic field. What's going to happen to the field? Is it going to fail? Is the CRD... Um, They, they suggest it's a CRD guide to have grass is the best cover for the septic field. And now I've found that the trees that we've planted some time ago and others that came in, I can't take them out. Thank you. Any other members of the public? Final time. All right, we shall move on. Thank you so much. Uh, next item is Mayor's message. Um, just to let you know, it's Orange Shirt Day coming up on September the 30th. Every Child Matters is the theme on this orange shirt. And for those of you who may not be aware of the program, it's an opportunity for First Nations, local governments, schools and communities to come together in the spirit of reconciliation and hope for generations of children to come. It evolved out of a true life story from a First Nations mom uh, who survived through the um, 
residential school system. So it's worth a Google and a read, and it comes up on September the 30th, and I think there's events all around the city. Councillor Chong, do you have something going on at UVic? 29th? 28th. 28th. So there'll be uh, an event up on at UVic on the 28th. Uh, anybody else on council? Councillor Nolt. Uh, thank you. First, I'd like to note that the mayor did not read the we acknowledge we are meeting on the shared traditional lands of the Coast Salish people at the beginning of the meeting. I'd yes, like I did. to acknowledge that. Yes, I did. And the second thing is my wife and I spent a lovely Saturday morning uh, with the Victoria Green team on, on Perimeter Park, west of Royal Bay Secondary. Uh, I think we cleared a couple of truckloads of uh, broom and blackberries. So I'd like to make note of the wonderful work our volunteers do and like to encourage council to continue supporting the green team. Anybody else? And that's it. I just got back from Edmonton where my aunt celebrated her 100th birthday. So there was a ton of family there doing that uh, birthday celebration. So uh, moving on, it's been a, a busy weekend. Uh, adoption of two sets of minutes, one the regular meeting of council August 27th and the other public hearing minutes for 20, uh, August 27th as well. Move adoption, your worship. Second. All those in favor, opposed, motion carried. And a number of sets of minutes to be received, uh, committee of the whole on May 7th, public hearing on August 27th, advisory planning commission on the 11th of April, and Emergency Planning Committee on May 15th. Second. All those in favor? Opposed, motion carried. Nothing in our business re uh, correspondence requiring council direction. Moving into item 6.1.1, uh, recommendation for development variance permit application DVP 18-005 for 3366 Ocean Boulevard. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, this is a, uh, a development permit, uh, excuse me, a development variance permit application to allow the construction of an accessory dwelling unit above an existing garage at uh, 3366 Ocean Boulevard. Uh, the applicant is requesting uh, the following variances from land use bylaw. A relaxation to increase the maximum size of an accessory dwelling unit uh, from 60 square meters to 85 square meters. Uh, secondly, relaxation to increase the maximum height of an accessory dwelling unit from 4.24 meters to 6 meters. And lastly, a relaxation to reduce the minimum side and rear yard setbacks for an outbuilding that exceeds one story from 3 meters to 1 meter. Uh, staff are supportive of this application, uh, provided that the applicant construct the accessory dwelling unit in accordance with the plans attached to the staff report to that went to the Advisory Planning Commission, uh, and that also uh, the applicant register a non-stratification covenant uh, prior to the issuance of a building permit. So the September 12th uh, Advisory Planning Commission um, was the venue where this was first reviewed by the city. Um, APC members um, brought up issues with respect to how the coach and carriage house would be uh, used. Uh, so the applicant uh, discussed that it was for uh, family use and that there was um, some comments about the extent of the setback variances. And staff explained that it was really um, to repurpose the existing structure, um, the garage there that's on site, which um, made it uh, a requirement to um, to uh, apply for the setback variances. So at the APC meeting, the uh, commission unanimously recommended that the staff recommendation be forwarded to council for consideration and approved. Thank you. Thank you. Comments, questions, council? <coughs> council? Uh, yes, just a quick question to uh, planning. I was unable to attend that APC meeting. Um, I note there was no public input into it and no concern to uh, neighbors spoke. Uh, did we receive any written submissions uh, opposing or for this uh, particular variance? Uh, th through the Your Worship, the uh, application um, included a, a letter of support from an adjacent uh, resident. Uh, so that was the one piece that we did uh, bring forward to the commission. Yeah. 
Move the recommendation, Your Worship. Second. Uh, all those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. Next item is 6.1.2, recommendation on development variance permit application DVP 18-006-1800 Island Highway. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, this is a development variance permit application to allow additional fascia signs um, and one that will be slightly over the maximum height as per the sign bylaw. This is part of an overall exterior renovation being undertaken at the Wendy's restaurant on Island Highway. As such, the applicant is requesting the following variances to the sign bylaw, uh, increasing the number of fascia signs from one to two uh, on the building face fronting Island Highway. Secondly, increase the number of fascia signs from one to two on the building face fronting the drive through, uh, which is interior to the site. And lastly, increasing the maximum height of a fascia sign from 1.2 meters to 1.57 meters for a fascia sign also fronting uh, the drive through at Wendy's. Uh, staff are supportive of the application, provided that the applicant construct the signs as per the submitted plans that were attached to the staff report. And at the Advisory Planning Commission, uh, this also went to the sep September 12th meeting. Uh, there were questions from the commission members as to whether the signs uh, fit with the overall theme for Colwood. Uh, staff explained that proposed signs did comply with the signage guidelines contained with the official community plan. Uh, commission members also inquired as to whether the signs would contribute to light pollution, and staff explained that the type and placement of signs are not expected to have a negative impact on light pollution. Therefore, the Advisory Planning Commission recommended that, uh, once again, this was unanimous, that the staff uh, recommendation be forwarded to Council uh, for a positive um, uh, review by Council. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Move the recommendation. Second. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. Following item 6.1.3 is the one that we have removed from our agenda. Moving then to 6.1.4. Report Senior Planner, request to waive Clause 9, Schedule A of Covenant Number CA4008583 and Discharge Covenant Number CA5950291 for 686 Donovan. Thank you, Your Worship. I think the staff report is quite self-explanatory in this case. Uh, we have a subdivision that's currently being developed. Uh, servicing has been installed, and it's predicated on a septic field being integrated into the roadway, uh, strata roadway that's proposed for the eight lot subdivision. The original plan for the subdivision at uh, 686 Donovan had the septic system located on uh, one or on lots one or two as per the, uh, the plan. And the, um, the new proposal is to have it, as I said, at the rear of, of the subdivision. And the last page of this um, item and the staff report uh, shows that new proposed plan. Uh, the applicant has <coughs> demonstrated that the approving authority, in this case, Allant Health, uh, that to them that this is a uh, adequate uh, means of disposing of, of sewer. And therefore, staffs recommend that the covenant that enshrines this issue uh, be amended, um, or excuse me, that it be discharged to allow for the septic field to be built as proposed. Therefore, staff recommend that uh, council approve the request to waive clause nine of the development agreement uh, CA4008583 and to discharge covenant CA5950291. Thank you. Comments, questions, Councillor Day? Thank you. Just a question um, through our official community plan, which we recently adopted. A uh, new development was to be on sewers. And I'm, I know this one has been in uh, the works for a while, but I just wonder how it affects uh, the future provision of sewers to the area. Your Worship, uh, as Councillor Day noted, this, this development was approved prior to the official community plan being adopted. Uh, we don't see that um, uh, policy impacting this issue. Uh, with respect to the future servicing of this area, uh, I think that this really functions separate from that decision. However, um, uh, depending on the timing, it might be viable for this subdivision to hook up to sewers in the future. 
However, um, there is no uh, sanitary sewer on a municipal system that they could uh, to use to develop at this time. And anything else? Yeah. Okay. Kay. Any other questions? Councillor Nolte? Yes, I note on the report that neither the original development agreement nor the covenant uh, have any signatures on them. Um, I would like future council meetings to get the full legal documents with the signatures to ensure that they have been adequately registered. Any other questions, comments from council? Move the recommendation. Second. Uh, all those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. Uh, next item, 6.1.5, part, uh, again, Director of Planning, park dedication to 170 Goldfinch Avenue. Thank you, Madam Mayor. So once again, the staff report, I think, is pretty clear cut in this case. Um, it might surprise some people to find that uh, 170 Goldfinch Avenue, which is uh, used as a, as a public open space, uh, is understood by the public to be um, a park uh, isn't actually dedicated as such. Uh, I know colloquially it's referred to as Pit House Park, but that's not the official name. And as stated in the staff report, naming of this uh, right now a municipal property uh, should probably be undertaken. And we are recommending that to happen after formal dedication of the property. Uh, the property was originally provided to the city as a uh, proceed uh, flowing from the uh, rezoning of uh, what was known as a quattro, uh, then um, Ocean Grove. Uh, the Comprehensive Development 6 zone is now being utilized to develop uh, what's called two waters um, at the former Ocean Grove site. So the waterfront portion of that land, which was provided as municipal property, was not dedicated that at, the, at that time and now staff feel it's appropriate uh, to do so. Therefore, uh, we recommend that council resolve to dedicate the property located at 170 Goldfinch Avenue, Avenue as parkland. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Day. So um, I find this a little confusing because we uh, only recently um, leased out the um, sales center and I'm not aware of us having any other park where we've, we've actually leased out a portion of the park. Uh, so I think if it had been done the other way around, this would not be possible. Uh, it wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to lease out, I don't think, an area of our park. Could you just comment on that? If I may, through your worship. The lease consideration that was provided for the for the two water sales center down at 170 Goldfinch, that report actually did speak to this property not being park designation at that time and was considered a lot at that time. However, the city may still enter into agreement to lease portions of park space as well as it did for 170 Goldfinch. So the consideration for that lease property was brought against the merits of the community charter in regards to engagement, public processes. Um, those processes were met, the public was engaged and offered comments, and so the disposition followed all the traditional rules of, of that sort of consideration, whether it be park or land. The changing of this designation from la a land asset to a park asset won't affect the lease, nor would it have changed the disposition consideration that was preceded by council. I, I'd also add that I, th I think the, the CD6 zone um, includes sales center is a permitted use in that space, so I think it was always the intention that um, there be that the, the multiple uses. So I would just comment that um, it, it was my understanding that that was why this wasn't uh, dedicated as park previously. I was on, on council when uh, the subdivision uh, was carried out and the sales center uh, was put in place with um, the idea that it would eventually become a community amenity when they were finished with the sales center. Uh, so I do think that it's in the best interest of the community that we've negotiated this lease and that we have um, the benefit of having tenants who are upgrading the building that was left um, vacant for some time. So. It is to the benefit, I believe, of the city, and I'm pleased that 
um, we're moving ahead with dedicating it as a park. I just thought for the public it looks a little odd that we would be leasing a portion of our park and uh, I'm pleased that we will have that for the future. Councilor Martin and then Mulch. Thank you. Uh, so I actually, I wanna go to uh, section six, which is the financial considerations. And I just wanna ask a question about changing this from a green space to a park. In past, I have asked Public Works uh, why the apple orchard part of it was not being sort of maintained by the park or why we weren't cutting the grass around the park and, and that. And I was told, well, it's a green space, it's not a park, we, we just let it go natural. Um, in the financial considerations, changing it from a green space to a park, I would assume that there was going to be additional cost because we're going to actually be maintaining it more High, to a higher standard than what we've been maintaining it as a green space. And I would just like some clarification. Are we maintaining it to a higher level than what we would maintain a green space? Or are there no financial considerations because we're going to maintain this piece of land the same way that we're maintaining it right now? Uh, <coughs> excuse me, through your worship, the, uh, whether it's park or green space, I don't think really is terribly relevant. The, it's the type of park. So if it's a recreational park, it has a, a considerably higher uh, maintenance um, cost than if it's a natural park. I think it was just probably poor terminology um, from our staff's perspective in that it was in considered natural, natural green space, so it was going to be left in a, a natural state. Um, and this park might but it's uh, ultimately up to council to be whether it's uh, determined whether it's a natural green space or a combination of a natural green space and a recreational park. That's something that we haven't explored yet. And uh, we do have a report coming to council that talks about um, park, ser park service levels. And uh, that will be extremely helpful to staff to get that advice back from council on the uh, expectations from council on the service levels for maintaining various uh, types of parks in the, in the community. Thank you. Yeah, Any other comments, questions? Um, oh. One of the things that has come up with the um, coastal erosion study was the possibility of removing the uh, Ocean Boulevard pump station and this was one of the prime locations in that it's city owned land and we wouldn't have to acquire anything. Uh, would a use as a sewer pump station be written into the allowed uses of this park? Uh, Your Worship, we don't see the dedication of this land as park uh, impeding a, a additional council decision to move the um, pump station to the site. Um, we're looking at including in the uh, zoning amendment uh, that councils direct us to undertake that would be a global review uh, to allow um, municipal structures and municipal uh, servicing such as pump stations in, in all zones. So um, that's something that we're looking to um, implement along with um, uh, in, in time for the uh, any changes that would be required to, to move the pump station. Uh, so we don't see this specific issue of park dedication impeding that. Okay. Need a recommendation? Oh. Second. Councillor Day? Sorry, just um, my mind's worrying on, on this one uh, because I, I do think there, there could well be opposition from the public to putting uh, a sewage pump station in a park. Um, so I, I just want to be very upfront about that. There certainly could be pushback from, from the community in terms of uh, that. I know that pump stations can be very lovely and they can provide amenities like the one at Esquimalt Lagoon does as washrooms, but I just feel that I would be remiss if I didn't say that this could very well be a problem for the public and I think it's important that there be a thorough discussion on that. Thank you. Is that all those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. Uh, next item is 6.1.6. Uh, again, from planning, 544 Winthrop Road, zoning amendment, bylaw number 1598, uh, RZ15003. If I may, Your Worship, I'll handle this one. 
Um, bylaw number 5098 regarding 544 Winthrop is on the council agenda tonight for fourth reading and adoption. The council direction at the meeting of September 14th of 2015 was that a section 219 covenant be registered for the conditions of council prior to the fourth reading of that bylaw. That covenant has been prepared and signed by the applicant. However, the document has not been fully registered at land titles at this time. We have uh, received a notice from their solicitor undertaking to register and they will have that document in their hands tomorrow night. I frankly expect it to be registered at land titles within a day and receive a pending number. If there's any uh, errors or corrections, the solicitor will also follow those through until there is adoption. If that's the concern of council, I'll remind them of section 131 of the community charter in which there's 30 days in regards to reconsideration of a motion. Thank you. So at this time, because we'll be dealing with it in the next section, looking for um, this report to be received. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. Into finance and administration, 6.2.1, report from Director of Finance on the 2019 permissive tax exemptions. Yes, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, before you, you have a report outlining the 2019 permissive tax exemption applications. Uh, Council most likely recalls that there's a legislative deadline of October 31st for permissive tax exemption bylaw to be adopted in order for it to be effective for the preceding year. So in other words, this year, um, uh, the, t uh, uh, the 2019 bylaw has to be adopted by October 31st, 2018. Uh, this year, the timing is a bit awkward uh, due to the election and due to the UBCM convention. We've lost a couple meetings. So normally, Council would have the opportunity to uh, review applications at a committee of the whole or at another venue, uh, but unfortunately uh, we've been left with fewer uh, fewer options this year. So if Council's uh, wishing to provide permissive tax exemptions for the 2019 uh, tax year, uh, today will be the day to give the first three readings on the uh, relevant uh, bylaws. So you have four applications uh, this year. Three of those applications are from organizations that have been previously approved in prior taxation years, and there's one new application. With respect to the previously approved organizations, bylaw 1743 has been prepared. Uh, this bylaw has been prepared with the same methodology as the previous exemptions, uh, exempting uh, a portion of the improvements only. Uh, there is a movement, uh, the Pacific Center Family Association uh, is now at its permanent location at 324 Goldstream, um, and consequently the exemption amount has uh, changed slightly as a result. There is one new application and bylaw 1744 has been prepared uh, with respect to that application. Uh, staff are not being presumptuous in terms of whether council wishes to provide an exemption to the application. If council does not wish to provide an exemption to that application, it would simply not give first, second, third reading to bylaw 1744 in section seven of today's agenda. This property is respect, uh, 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 this application is with respect to 2301 Marlene Drive it's owned by Namaste, and it's leased by Toyosa uh, Society. Thank you for the pronunciation earlier. Um, the um, uh, Toyosa so uh, Society is providing residence to two uh, folks with uh, disabilities. The bottom um, of the building, the basement, is used by uh, Lifetime Networks to provide uh, a Being Citizens cultural cooking program which targets adults with disabilities. And Lifetime Networks also uses uh, the surrounding uh, garden um, for an inclusion, inclusion works uh, program. So the bylaw provides a full exemption to both land and improvements as it is stated now. Uh, lastly, uh, staff in this report are, re are recommending that council move to a four year uh, exemption cycle. That's something for consideration uh, this year. We're proposing that the exemption bylaw be harmonized with the uh, election terms. The rationale for that is simply that the permissive tax exemptions remain relatively stable from year to year, uh, so there could be significant uh, administrative savings both on staff and, and the applicant if we move to a four-year exemption cycle. Um, and it would also provide a bit of financial uh, clarity to the exemption uh, applicants from year to year. Uh, as uh, pointed out at the beginning of the um, uh, a meeting there are some representatives from f some of the organizations here today and so if you have any questions uh, they'd be happy to answer thank you very much um, questions
afternoon's comments. We do have the applicant here in the audience. I know it's a little bit of a diversion from our usual process, but they are available seeing as they are new to the app to this particular um, and available. Councilor Day. So I have uh, two questions. The first is in regard to the harmonization with the council term. And uh, as you know, we have a fee-for-service arrangement with Pacific Centre Family Services to provide um, um, youth counselling uh, program. And uh, I'm just curious, if we move to the four-year term and there was a change, I'm not expecting it to happen, but if Pacific Centre was no longer offering that service or something changed, how would that work? in terms of bringing that forward because it's very specific to um, the the exact percentage mm -hmm. of the building that's used for the for the service yes th uh, through your worship so uh, two points here first of all um, the Pacific Center Family Association is the recipient of a grant as you correctly pointed out um, the resolution from council was to continue providing that grant until 2019 so it will continue to show up in the uh, annual budget. Um, council can rescind that intention at, at any time, uh, so it is under um, council considera consideration every year, just not specifically pointed out by staff since we have a resolution to abide by. With respect to the exemption, same, um, same thing occur occurs generally. Uh, when an exemption is provided for the following year, there's usually not an opportunity for council to rescind that exemption within that year, and that's simply because of the way the legislation works. So should council wish to uh, rescind an exemption, there would be a one-year waiting period to do so. Thank you. Um, my second question was for uh, the Namaste Society, our new applicant this year. And my question was whether or not you had applied for a community grant in the past. Uh, we've applied for many, many grants. Um, as I said earlier, I'm a parent, and my son, I have three children. They're 28, 29, and 31. And uh, my youngest is a nurse, and the next one is a child development specialist, and our eldest uh, his name's Corbin, and he attends Namaste, and he's a music enthusiast and a real contributing member to the society. Um, I'm also quite involved with Lifetime Networks, and so we do absolutely apply for grants. We, we have fee for service, so we have families that pay for their supports, and um, people pay individually because they work, and people also have government funding that's attached to them, and uh, we also apply for grants. Yes, we apply for, for many, many community grants. So just to clarify, have you applied for a grant from the City of Colwood in the past? We have not. This is our first foray into the City of Colwood grants. Okay. Um, so I would just add my comment then is the, the permissive tax exemption is, is um, it's, it's quite a big, big deal. It's yes, administratively it a bit onerous um, and uh, it might be more appropriate for an organization such as yourself to apply for an annual grant rather than to apply for a permissive tax exemption. Yeah, so, I, so I'm executive director of, of Lifetime Networks and I was hired in 2000 at 10 hours a month and we had a, grant, a, a budget of 20,000 and now in, in 2018 we have a, a budget of, of 3 million and we support 450 families and we have 160 staff. So our connection and affiliation with Namaste and with Kiosa, which means to choose, is that they, they are small and they're really, really struggling. They provide an incredible service. So the two guys who live in Kiosa came out of the institutions. Uh, there's a lot of abuse, um, a lot of, of isolation, a lot of loneliness, and and Namaste as well supports many, many, well, not many, 13 men, um, most of whom came, came out of the institutions. Namaste was formed when uh, Glendale shut down, and that's why it's called Transition to Community Society. So the executive director of Namaste had these men 
who didn't have family, who'd grown up in the institutions that were shut down in, in the um, early 90s. And he went, we, we've got to do something. So of these men, then there were two who were inc incredibly just so... Um, so isolated, so, so hurt. And so he, he formed Kyosa Society, which is, is to choose. And that's, that's what this is about, this home is about for these two men. This, this man, his name's Terry, who started these societies, he's very compassionate, um, very loving, very dedicated. He's not a businessman at all. So when, when my son and us got involved, we thought, okay, in the last couple of years, we need to do something to make sure that, that Namaste and Kiosa survive. Because the people in Namaste and Kiosa don't, don't tend to have families. They don't tend to have anybody. And Terry holds their heart, and now we hold their heart. And so th there's, a, there's a backing of a, of a larger agency behind them. And a finance director, Carlene, who's really passionate about what she does, we thought, okay, let's, let's look at this and see what we can do. So we want to really make Kiosa vibrant in the community. So now we, we've taken one of our programs called Inclusion Works, and they go into to Kiosa, into the, the suite, and um, they're supporting the Humane Society. So they're doing peanut butter and jelly and, and bread kits. So they're making the bread, they're making the jam, they're making, they're making the peanut butter. I went, really, you're making the peanut butter? They are crushing the peanuts a whole bit. And, and donating back to the Humane Society. And that's supporting those 10 young adults with disabilities who are really looking to contribute to their society or their community. So that's, that's running out of Kiosa. They also put in, in um, food boxes because they want to start to create um, sustainability in the food banks in Colwood. So looking at all this... Our, our two guys who live there, um, I mean, their, their entire funding is about $1,130 a month. So if we can get an ex uh, 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 exemption on the, on the taxes, then that's going to put more money back into what we can contribute back to, to these two guys, back to the Inclusion Works guys, going back into Colwood, going back into that entire community. We're looking at, at doing renovations that because Kiosa needs it. It really needs it. We'll be in, employing Collarwood, Collarwood um, businesses. It's, it's, a whole, it's a whole community, and that's kind of why we're here. So it's not, it's not Kiosa on their own because, my heavens, they wouldn't make it, and neither would Namaste either because Namaste is built entirely on, on heart and love. So is Lifetime. We have, we, have a, we have a better business sense. So that's, that's where we are, that's why we're here, and that's why we're really appealing to you to, to give us a chance. Any other comments or questions of the applicant? Motion roll. Uh, yes, your report specifically mentions yeah. uh, three agencies working out of that serving residents of Colwood. How many residents do you serve in a typical year, or how many are you serving now? In where? Uh, well, you say there's three agencies within this property that you're asking the tax exemption for. No, Lifetime Networks is not in Colwood, and Lifetime Networks supports about 450 families. Out, out in Namaste, we have 13 individuals and families, and then in Kyosa, we have two, two gentlemen who live there, and then we, we leverage that property in order to build back into the Colwood community. So it's not, there's not handy darts coming in. It's, it's only um, people bus. We really believe in that because it doesn't make sense for people to be being driven everywhere. People need to be independent, understand busing. So in, in the suite of Namaste, we have, hmm, on, a, on a given time maybe, four or five people in a day who are coming in, working on the gardening, working on the landscaping, working on the peanut butter and jam and bread packages. But no one, they don't live there. They come in by bus and, and access that space in order to give back to themselves to create the community. Um, what I'm feeling is this should be more of an application for a grant and aid rather than a permissive property tax exemption. Um, 
I, I really don't see the property as being used as a residence for two individuals. Uh, other agencies that are using the, their properties for similar things are paying taxes on those portions that are used. Uh, just a finance sorry, just question. just um, just on a, f a financial perspective on that, I just want to give uh, council some uh, background. These two individuals received from the federal government three hundred and seventy-five dollars for rent, and from that rent, those property taxes have to be paid. Namaste has purchased the property; it was on a rent lease to own. Um, Kiosa pays rent when they can. It is not a sustainable financial model. The provincial government has let these gentlemen down. They have let many people down. I'd like to find somebody in this room who pays $375 for their rent. That is what they are allocated. The rest of that has to come from other means. This house is in desperate need of repair. If we can have an exemption of $3,000 from this council, we can do many things with that. We can input back into Colwood. We will be applying for grants elsewhere to do that. We'll also be applying for permits to do renovations, which will then encompass money back into the city of Colwood again. So I see this as a win-win situation that nobody can lose here by investing $3,000 a year into this home, into these gentlemen who have lived in this home for many years. It means they don't have to sell their home. It means they don't have to go out on the streets because that's where they're headed. Because who here can live on $375 a month? I know I can't. That's what we ask these people to do. We ask them to live on $375 a month. And we ask them to contribute to $3,000 in taxes to do that. Nowhere else can we go. The government, of the provincial government will not. We have negotiated. We have banged our heads. There is no more money coming from there. This is a hope for them. And it's one of the last. So I'd really ask you to consider that we do everything we can. Um, I also would like to mention um, and a, a four-year exemption in doing that is um, astronomical. I know the work it takes to write a grant. These grants don't take five minutes. They don't take an hour. They take hours to write. I know they take hours for finance and other people to review. So when uh, bodies like yourselves can take the time once out of four years, once out of three years, to review these, it saves everybody time and money. So I, I applaud you for or putting that motion forward that doing more than a single year, um, it really does save money in the long run. But again, when you make these decisions, I really like to think, um, can you live on $375 a month to rent your home? Any further comments, questions? Made a recommendation. It's going to. Yep. That's yeah, so I uh, just moved to receive. I'm just. I'm do do. I'm just going to go back to staff before we call the question on that only because it, this will come back on September 24th. Do we have to do anything around the um, doing the permissive, like the four-year term piece? Do we have, do we, do you need a comment now or just send the whole recommendation as is? If it's council's will to move to a four-year tax exemption term uh, starting in 2019 effective for 2020, then uh, a resolution would be appreciated. Thank you. Okay, so that part we may have to consider. The motion to receive is fine. Sure, no, I'm happy to amend. And if, if that's it, but or no do, motion you wanna, do you want to do the receive and then do another one? Or but yeah, we can, well, yeah, I think we, pardon? The recommendation is made. Yeah, uh, like the, the second part of it is is to receive, but the first part of it is to direct staff to prepare that as a four-year term. Seconder on that one? All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you. And next is report in building inspections and bylaw services, bylaw for management and protection of urban forests within the city of Colwood, 6.2.2. .2. Thank you, Your Worship. 
Uh, bylaw 1735 is presented for council uh, for three readings tonight. The bylaw is based on the resolutions of council and the recommendations of the Urban Task Force. The MTI bylaw is also presented to uh, for changes to the to synchronize the two bylaws together. Uh, there has been one change with respect to the protected trees, which was indicated in the staff report, which was around significant tree. Because uh, we don't have any uh, significant trees identified, then to include them in the bylaw was problematic. Um, this can then be brought forward at a later date to be included. Uh, staff were looking for some criteria and a process in which to establish that. You. Thank you. Uh, so I have two questions. Uh, the first question is the easy one. Where I'll just go back to uh, Philip uh, Nurse uh, and his questions regarding uh, the beginning. Uh, and I'm hoping people paid attention to what his questions were because I was just hoping for an answer. So or would you like me to repeat them? No. So section five in the exemptions is in respect to tree management plans, which refers to section seven, which is permits. Uh, tree management plan is a defined term. Um, what the exemption he was or uh, you're looking at um, doesn't require him to have a tree management plan to cut down trees as long as he presents a uh, plan to council that gets approved. So then the question is in regards to removing trees, then the requirement for replacement trees is part of the tree management plan, but because he doesn't require one, that's not in effect. May I, may I do a follow-up? Uh, I, I apologize, but I'm more confused. Uh, so mm -hmm. could, we, um, could we start again and uh, say it one more time, and I apologize to the rest of the council if everybody else gets it, but I, I just didn't understand it uh, properly. So, uh, oh, so let me, let me rephrase, I will, I will attempt to rephrase it from a question standpoint so that I, maybe that'll help. So, there needs to be a tree management plan for the Colwood Golf Course. That's or correct. excuse me, Royal Colwood. Has that plan been already on the books? Or is that a plan that will have to come from the future? Go ahead. Through the chair, <laughs> I'm aware that the golf club does have a tree management plan. That needs to be presented to council for approval. Okay. Once that's been approved, they then have an exemption under the bylaw, and then they don't require a tree management permit, and therefore don't require to follow the replacement trees, which was the question originally. Right. And and so in maybe with, with your permission through the mayor, w may I'm may I ask Phil? Yeah. yeah. To, to, I, to I just, just want to get clarified, clarified on it because your, your, your words, if I remember, was it was a bit vague and I'm reading here. So under Section 5 exemptions, it says a tree management permit is not required where a tree management plan has been submitted and approved by council. Are you clear with what staff has indicated? I believe so. For first of all, a plan was submitted to the city back in May when this whole process began. My question was twofold. I understand five number one dash I, yes, but then it's never referenced again. So the questions beyond that, because that was my clarification, was A, does the ratio of replanting, now are we subjected to that? Or anybody who has a forest vegetation plan within the municipality of Colwood, that part of it as well was the other question I had, that was section nine. And then the other one about one to five trees and what happens if Royal Colwood wants to, based on our forest vegetation plan, want to remove 21 trees in a segment or a swat of land. There's nothing in there past five trees, so that's where my unclarity was to that as well. So you don't have to provide replacement trees because you don't require a tree management permit because you, as long as you get a, your tree management plan approved by council, okay. the bylaw in effect does not apply. Yeah, it just was bylaw as it was written as I interpret it, one man's interpretation was not clear to me, so that's what I needed clarification for. So that's one part of it. And what about above five trees? So if our forest vegetation plan, speaking to rural colored specifically, is going to remove an area of six trees or 10 or 15, 
as long as that what you're saying is adopted by the city of Hallwood as a whole, then I can move forward and do what I need to do on the property to manage that. Am I correct on that? That's correct, because you're working within your plan. Okay, thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, and then my, my second question, or uh, I guess my, it's m more of a statement than I guess a question, is <coughs> on, on May 7th and on the May 14th, when this first came, uh, I voted against um, this bylaw. Uh, I will still continue to vote against this bylaw, but I, I guess I want to explain the reasoning why, was that we, um, as a council, we appointed a, a task force of what we considered experts to give a recommendation of how to move this urban tree forest plan forward. They came forward with a uh, recommendation which was disputed, and I understand that, that there was, a, there was a large minority in that who wanted to see the reduction down to 30 centimeters from the recommended 60. Um, and I understand, and, and Councillor Nault actually did a very good job with his props and everything else to demonstrate why he, uh, he thought it should be down from, from 60 to 30. I have a very strong feeling, however, that when we ask experts to, to give an opinion, um, that we take that opinion seriously and that we actually listen to that opinion. Uh, and I'm not saying this council hasn't. I'm just suggesting that I, I think I have a legitimate reason why I would think that we should stay with the task force recommendation at 60. Um, in saying that, uh, I will not be supporting it moving forward for that specific reason. Councillor Day. Thank you. Um, my question is to staff uh, regarding the forest management plan. Uh, is this forest management plan going to be presented annually? Uh, uh, through the chair, I would say that would be a decision that council would make. Um, if the uh, plan is followed, then there's no change to it. Then um, I don't think another another plan would need to be presented annually. If the golf board decides to change their plan, then that's not being approved by council. So a resubmission would be have to be made. I see a follow-up, Councillor Day. So um, my concern w with this, um, and, and indeed with, with the bylaw, is that um, it isn't really um, a level playing field for the citizens who planted a tree in their backyard, and they have a plan, obviously, at least in their minds, if nowhere else. Uh, and then, um, you know, years down the road, uh, they, they need to make a change to that plan because, you know, the tree didn't survive or hasn't done well or it's caused some other problems. Um, and then we have the forest management plan uh, that, say, the Royal Call Golf Course would create, and we don't really have any way to verify if that's being followed or not. If, if residents of Colwood see, you know, trees coming down at, at the golf course um, and, you know, the answer that they get when they contact the city is that the, there is a forest management plan um, and it's been duly presented to council and council has approved it, but if there's nobody checking to see that the plan is actually being followed or that um, the, the actions that are being taken, I'm not saying that they wouldn't be, I'm just saying that there's a lot, there's a lot of room for interpretation there, uh, especially for um, members of the public who, who, or even members of council who aren't intimately knowledgeable about the plan. Uh, so my concern is that I think we do need to have, I don't know if it's annual or biannual, but we do need to have some sort of regular updates to council so that council knows uh, where we stand, how, how we're doing with our forest management plan. Is it working out the way we, we thought? Are people comfortable with it? Uh, because presenting 
the plan might be that we've decided, you know, we're we're taking out the forest in this area and we're putting in a new, I don't know, new driving range. But I, I'm just saying it could be a, a very vastly different uh, arrangement between what we think is going to happen with what, what actually happens on the ground and the biggest um, problems seem to result from where we aren't regularly checking in uh, to see how, how progress is moving forward. Anybody else? Councillor Rowe? I would have to say that a tree management plan is going to address a long-term issue of which trees you're going to remove and when and how you're going to replace them or re-landscape. Uh, so uh, presenting it on an annual basis I th don't think would be necessary as long as it's a long-term document. I think it would be onerous on somebody like a golf course to come back to us every year and say, we're going to take out 10 trees this year. And uh, if, if the long-term plan says, this is how our management is going to happen, uh, we're not going to get any surprises. Uh, we're still going to have to inspect because we know sometimes people try to sneak around the uh, edges of the rules. But uh, as long as it's a long-term plan, I don't see an, a need for renewing it annually. Um, and as far as the question we had about whether um, trees within a building envelope uh, are exempt from permits. Uh, the way I read the exemptions, uh, they definitely are. If you've got a development permit, you're exempt from those tree removal uh, uh, permits. So uh, I, I don't see any problem with that one. Uh, as far as the tree management plan, if somebody's taking out six trees in their yard, they're going to need a tree management plan. That's <laughs> that to me is, is already onerous. To make them do it every year, um, I think would be a little bit ridiculous. So we have a couple of very large landowners that are going to have to file very long-term plans. The majority of the people that are being affected by this bylaw, there's only going to be a few trees. Uh, and with five or fewer, all you need to do is tell them you're taking them out and telling them wh where you're putting the new trees in. Uh, I, I think that is a nice compromise from the original bylaw with being overly restrictive. And as far as reducing the uh, DBH from 60 centimeters to 30, um, I think uh, council made the right decision. The uh, committee itself was pretty much split down the middle on that one. And if you go around, say, uh, Royal Roads University and start measuring how many of those trees are bigger than 60 centimeters, you'd be surprised how many would be exempt from the need for a permit. So. Uh, in the case of residential lands, we want to start encouraging people, I believe, to move to a more urban forest away from having 200-foot uh, tall Douglas firs and cedars in their front yard and maybe towards more urban-friendly trees. And if you're going to make it 60 centimeters, uh, none of those urban-friendly trees will be protected. So I, I think it's the right decision to go with 30. And we can review that in a year or two and, and see if it's been overly restrictive. I'm happy to go back there. Any other comments? Recommendation is uh, on page five and six. Move the recommendation, Your Worship. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. Uh, next one is 6.2.3, report from Corporate Surfa Services in regards to proposed amendment to Council Committee Procedure Bylaw. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, tonight we have this issue in front of council because we're doing an amendment to the council's uh, procedure bylaw, which is the bylaw that governs how all our meetings are managed and handled. Um, we are going to be doing a full review of the entire bylaw and hopefully bringing that forward in the next few months. But this is just addressing uh, four things that we felt needed attention immediately. Uh, one of them, or two of them, fall under the definition sections of the bylaw and uh, while we were researching this, we discovered that the definition of committee and de definition of committee as a whole um, really needed clarification. Th the definition of committee needed correction. Uh, a committee is a select ad, ad hoc standing committee that's established by council. It's not committee of the whole, and it's usually comprised of members of council as well as members of the public. For some reason, the wording says it's comprised solely of council members, which is not accurate. 
And under the committee of the whole description, it just says it means it's committee of the whole council. It really should say it's committee of the whole, uh, uh, excuse me, it's a committee of the whole meeting of the council solely comprised of council members. There are no members of the public. So we want to make those two corrections. Uh, the other two corrections relate to inaugural meetings uh, and regular meetings of council. And the one to do with the inaugural meeting is because legislation has changed. It's moved our elections from December, or excuse me, November into October, October 20th. <laughs> <laughs> and the inaugural meeting was always held, it had to be within the first 10 days of December. Well, now it's the first 10 days of November. Our bylaw doesn't say that, which means we have to get that changed and get it changed before the inaugural meeting. So we're looking for that change from council tonight. In the month of December, we've always held our regular meetings the first and third Mondays. That made it easier for when we'd had uh, election years and there wasn't confusion about people knowing when to come and not come. Uh, we have our Christmas closure all the time. There's this cause and effect. So with the meeting moving, excuse me, the inaugural meeting moving to November, what we're looking for the bylaw amendment to do is to establish that uh, on the first Monday in November is our inaugural meeting to have two regular meetings of council, as we always do, in the month of November, and to establish the second Monday in December as a regular council meeting. We're not going to recommend the fourth Monday as usual because it usually conflicts with the Christmas closure and then we have to do cancellation notices. So keeping in mind we can always call a special meeting when there's a need, those are the four things that we're presenting in the uh, proposed bylaw 1740 under the bylaw section tonight and we're hoping council supports those changes and we'll consider first three readings at that time. Any questions to staff on it? All understood? All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. Moving into transportation and public infrastructure 6.3.1. No, oh yeah, we got one more meeting in there. Uh, back up please, folks, 6.2.4 in regards to consideration of canceling the regular meeting of council scheduled for October 22nd. Go ahead. Thank you, Your Worship. So we have this item before council because of the timing of the election on October the 20th. <laughs> The regular meeting of council would be held on October 22nd. So to allow everybody to focus more on so much that's going on, the upcoming inaugural meeting, we're recommending that council uh, authorize staff to send out a cancellation notice for the October 22nd regular meeting. All those in favor? Opposed? You're opposed? I am. Why? Because you don't want to buy cake for my birthday. <laughs> No, no, my, uh, thank you. Uh, if I was to speak on the, on the motion, Your Worship, my attitude is that uh, the city's business doesn't stop just because there's an election. And, and in my opinion, um, we owe it to, to the taxpayer to continue working right up into the last day of our, our term. So um, for me, an elect uh, I, I appreciate staff's uh, sensitivities, but uh, uh, to me, an election is an excuse to stop doing the city's business. So, so that's why I am opposing the Anybody else? All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. <laughs> I am that one. Yeah, yeah you be that one. Else You're the key one. one. Uh, transportation public infrastructure, 6.3.1. Uh, recommendation is around coastline erosion study, final report and recommendation. Who's taking it? Well, I'll just our engineer is not here. I move so. the uh, recommendation, Your Worship. This this motion came out of the committee of the whole, which we had debated yep. as it was. Well, right? It was all done. Seconder. Any further discussion or comments, Councillor Day? Thank you. I just think that for the public, it's not really fair. We're all looking at our uh, agendas, and this is a recommendation came out of. Committee of the Whole looking at um, a report that we received on uh, uh, on sea level rise and uh, the uh, protection of the sewer lift station at Esquimalt Lagoon. And the recommendation is to bring forward um, a line item 
for budget consideration uh, to add 200 meters of beach nourishment, uh, which is adding sand to the beach, and the removal of improperly placed filter cloth uh, below the upper layer of rock armoring at the Ocean Boulevard pump station. And this is all just to be considered during the budget process, one of many cost drivers that the city will be looking at. Mover and shaker, all those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, 6.3.2, recommendation again, coming out of uh, Committee of the Whole, uh, Ocean Boulevard pump station relocation options and flood construction levels with setback. Your Worship, I'll move the uh, first recommendation that uh, Council directs staff to have KWL further refine option one, which is a relocation to Pithouse Park, noted in KWL's technical memorandum entitled Pump Station Relocation Options, uh, revision two, dated August 28th, et cetera. And that council directs staff to ensure the flood, that flood construction levels be recalculated by KWL prior to the final design and siting for the relocation of the Ocean Boulevard Pump Station. If any recommendations are endorsed by council from coastline Erosion study undertaken by Northwest Hydraulic Consultants Limited. Second. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. And a second recommendation was in involved in this one. Yes. Council Knox. Um, I believe that's redundant, as we've already considered uh, reclassifying that as, as a park. We're complete ah. on that one. I'll redline it. Uh, now we are moving then into bylaws, folks. Bylaw number 1598 for final reading. Colwood Land Use Bylaw number 151-1989, amendment for 544 Winthrop Road. Do the final. Second. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. Uh, 7.2, bylaw number 1735, first, second, and third readings for Urban Forest Bylaw number 1735-2018. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. Move second. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. Uh, bylaw number 1739, final reading. Elected officials, oath of office. Bylaw number 1739, 2018. Move second. Second. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. Uh, bylaw number 1740, again, first, second, and third readings. It's the Council and Committee Procedure Bylaw Amendments. Second. second. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. Move second. Second. Any comments? All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. Move carried. Second. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. Uh, 7.5, bylaw number 1741, again, first, second, and third readings. This is for the MTI information bylaw, um, schedules 1 through 19. Move introduction. Second. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. I'll move second. Nobody wants to second. second. Oh. Any questions, comments? <laughs> All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. 7.6 bylaw number 1742, first, second, and third readings for development permit delegation bylaw number 1742. Move introduction. Second. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. Move second. Second. Any comments, questions? Councillor Day. Thank you. I won't be supporting uh, this bylaw. I didn't support first reading either, just to let you know why. I believe that council should be doing this themselves. I have voted consistently against delegation of authority. Call the question, all those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. Any third? third? Second, third? Sure, second. All those in favor? 
Opposed? Motion carried. 7.7 uh, .7 bylaw number 1743, first, second, and third readings in regards to 2019 permissive tax exemption bylaw number 1743, 2018. Move introduction. Second. All those in favor? Opposed? Yep. 7.7, .7, you're good. Uh, all those in favor, we'll call that again. Opposed? Motion carries full. Uh, second, I need. Move second. Any questions, comments? We're good. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. Move third. Second. <laughs> All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. Uh, final bylaw this evening, bylaw number 1744, first, second, and third readings for the 2019. Why do we have this one? Oh, oh it's we because it's, it's, it's the second one. Yeah, it's yeah. the second one. Uh, bylaw number 1744 for second and third readings. Move introduction. Second. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. Move and second. Second. Comments, questions, Councillor Day? Thank you. I do not support this at this time. Uh, I believe that. Um, these are new applicants. They have never received a community grant from the city of Colwood before. And while I applaud what they're doing and in fact would support them through a different methodology, I find that um, because I'm not familiar uh, with the organizations involved and because they haven't applied to the city of Colwood before mm -hmm. and because permissive tax exemptions are a little different than just a regular grant, uh, I think it's very important that we have um, a long-term understanding of an organization before we include them on our permissive tax exemptions. So I'm not supporting this one. Calling second, all those in favor? Opposed? Motion fails. We stop. Yeah. Uh, in camera, there is one item of release for in camera. Appointment. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Yes, that was the appointment of the Deputy Emergency Program Coordinator, uh, the City Planner, uh, Dennis Carlson. Um, looking for adjournment. Move adjournment. All those in favor? Opposed. Motion carried. Thank you, folks.